Good morning and welcome to today's webinar. I'm Patrick Williams with Greenhouse Management Magazine and I'll be your moderator for today's installment of the DRAM Everything Water webinar series. This webinar is titled Complete Water Treatment Considerations for Improved Profit. Treating your water is traditionally like buying insurance. You purchase it to protect yourself from loss. Instead of considering water treatment like a straight insurance plan, where you only receive a payout in cases of loss or damage, DRAM looks at proper water treatment to be more like an annuity with the benefit beyond loss paying dividends on the investment. Having clean water should be more than just a risk management cost. It should improve your profit. Our presenter today is Al Zilstra. Al is Division Manager of DRAM Water, the Water Management Division of DRAM Corporation of, of Manitowoc, Wisconsin. Al has 28 years of experience designing, supplying, and supporting horticulture environment technology systems for commercial and, and institutional growing facilities. Al's experience includes water treatment and water management system design, irrigation, nutrient injection, heating, and computerized environment control systems for greenhouses, nurseries, and indoor growing facilities. Al is a frequent presenter at horticulture industry seminars and forums. As you have questions for Al, please send them to us via the questions box in the go to, in the go to meeting panel, and we'll have a few minutes at the end to answer them in a Q&A session. And with that, I'll hand things off to Al. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, thank you to Greenhouse Management Magazine, GIE Publishing, for uh, hosting this. Also, thank you for everyone who has joined us today. Uh, this is, uh, we're into year 78, I think, as a company. We celebrated our 75th anniversary a, uh, a couple of years ago, and we are presenting this series. This is a, the final in a series of three. <clears throat> I hope that many of you were able to join the presentations by Kirk Becker and Les Evans over the past two months. I'm Al Zilstra, as Patrick said, and this is the final in the series. The DRAM team sees a lot of greenhouses every year. We're in greenhouses, our team members are in greenhouses on a weekly basis. And for something as fundamental to growing as water, we still see plenty of room for improvement in water systems. Uh, the number one input in horticulture in, is irrigation water. Please do send in the questions for the Q&A period at the end. We we'll look forward to those. They enhance the, uh, uh, this meeting because more information always comes out when questions are submitted. So I look forward to those. We're gonna be talking about water treatment design considerations. I played with several titles, just four short words to introduce a subject that would likely require four days of intense seminars to address in a truly complete fashion. There is no way that I can address the entire subject today, but my hope is that I can help the process, help understand the maze that it feels like to select a water treatment system and how to go about that. Water quality really affects absolutely everything in the greenhouse facility. In science, as well as shrinking margins and other challenges, labor challenges among them, is showing us that the impact and the opportunity of water quality, of high quality water, is far more significant than we've suspected in the past. Water quality affects the product quality or grade if you're a vegetable grower. Uh, increasingly, we see that in sell-through, plant health and pest and disease resistant, it affects shelf life and sell through, yield, the amount of shrink that we see in the production process, and chemical use, among other things. I remember Anna Ball uh, writing an article several years ago that talked about the shrink from the time a seed is produced until it gets to the consumer and survives in the garden. And I don't recall the exact numbers, but somewhere in the neighborhood of less than a third of all of the seeds actually came through to a full production and lived in somebody's garden. So today's objectives, tried to narrow it down to four narrow objectives. 
First of all, just what is optimum irrigation water quality? What does it look like? Second is to identify cost factors associated with non-optimum irrigation water. What is the real cost of having lower water quality than we could or than we should? Third, how do we think through the water treatment system selection process? I looked hard at, at going through and doing a design of a water treatment system, but as I think Les said in his last presentation, a month ago, the, if you take two greenhouse facilities or growing facilities that are identical in the same state and the same neighborhood, the water treatment requirements and the water treatment system would look different. So it's better, I think, to guide you through the water treatment selection process so that you know how to think it through, not necessarily what the answer is. And then last, to identify alternatives that work and those that don't and why they don't. We're trying hard to not do too much advertising here to just make it uh, make you aware of what the selections are. But it is important to identify what has been demonstrated as not working and why. So we'll talk about that briefly. So what is optimized irrigation water? Webster defines optimized as to make as perfect, effective, or functional as possible. When I see a lot of greenhouses, I do not see, I see good water quality, but I do not see water quality as perfect, effective, or functional as it could be. These are the basics that we consider in evaluating the treatment requirements for irrigation water. At DRAM, we always start the process before we do anything else with a water analysis. So the first thing we look at, as everybody else does, is what is the appropriate pH level for the crop that's being grown and how do we get the water there? What is the balanced ion profile that we want to have for the crop that we've got? What are the appropriate levels of trace elements, iron, manganese, boron, zinc? And here's where we start to look at, maybe we need to remove some excess elements out of the water uh, through a, a process, a treatment process, such as iron or manganese is quite common. The next, we look at low pathogenic microbes. We want to have low pathogenic microbes. We generally consider that 99.9% or uh, or less exclusion or reduction of the microbes. Then free of algae and biofilm constituents. Les talked about this in his talk, that biofilm is a major issue in our industry, far greater than we thought it was 10 or 15 years ago because of what we've learned. We wanna have adequate or better dissolved oxygen in the water. We want it to be temperate, not too hot and not too cold to shock the plants or to be free of dissolved, to have low dissolved oxygen. And of course, we want it to be free of damaging chemical residue. When we look at water, sometimes we think, well, the plant gets wet, the soil gets moist, we irrigated, the plant has water available to it. But we don't think about sometimes the that a lot of little things add up when compounded. One percent, just a single penny, can be very, very significant for an operation when compounded. Small improvements in multiple areas add up quickly and substantially. What is the accumulated value of a one percent savings or improvement in each of the following areas? Optimizing water quality affects every area such as shrink during the germination and rooting process, shrink during grow out, plants that don't survive, plugs that don't survive, cuttings that don't root properly, and then shrink at retail, plants that are not healthy enough to survive in a retail environment while they're waiting to be picked up by a consumer. Reduced consumer satisfaction, the plant doesn't survive once it once it's put in the garden uh, or in the planter because of pythium in the roots or other issues or simply not, not a hardy plant. Customer doesn't want to come back and buy that again. Reduced 
labor inefficient or increased labor inefficiencies, having to move plants around, having to search when you're shipping uh, for high quality plants, reduced or slow sell through. One of the labor inefficiencies also that we see a lot of is uh, clogging of emitters and people having to scout for, for clogged emitters and plants that are in threat of, of, uh, of dying because of that. More chemical applications. Chemicals are getting more expensive and we have fewer and fewer of them available to us. A longer heating system season. If we uh, have to start early because we have a slow growing process, that's a longer heating season, more money. I like to think about progress thinking beyond the negative. So we think in terms of progress or progressive thinking going beyond the negative. So much of water treatment in our industry is looked at as achieving a negative, a negative pathogen count and negative uh, excess salt levels uh, in our water. But we don't often think about the progress beyond that. So are we looking at just treating the disease outbreak? We don't do anything to prevent it. We just treat it once it occurs. The next step up of progressive thinking would be to look at preventing the next disease occurrence. How do we do that? That might deal with water treatment. That might deal with biofilm. That might be, deal with environmental conditions in the greenhouse. A third level might be to enhance the plant's quality or ability to resist disease so the plant itself can, can defend itself. And a fourth that we're looking at today is how to maximize the plant's performance and value to access those hidden profit dollars that we see going out the door in various forms of shrink. It's important to realize that there is no silver bullet. I can't stress this enough. There is no single solution. The reason I stress that is that even today, I see growers that purchase a solution. Somebody says this will do the trick or that will do the trick or install this piece of equipment or install that piece of equipment. There is no such thing as a piece of equipment that will get the job done. We do have plenty of tools at our disposal. It always requires more than one. I thought about this yesterday. I was finishing final preparations. Have I ever had a project where a single tool, whether it was a, 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 an RO system or an oxygenation system or a nutrient injection or or some type of disinfection system would solve the problem. And I can't think of a single one where just one tool would get the job done. And it's important also to realize that those tools need to be in the correct process order. This is something that I see frequently, the right piece of equipment, but put in the wrong order or in the wrong place in the water flow. So it's not able to get the job done or not able to get the job done as well as possible. For example, putting iron, uh, iron removal equipment immediately after uh, or immediately before acid injection. Iron wants to stay in solution at low pH. If I have, if I have uh, lowered my pH prior to trying to remove the iron, I'm going to have a harder time doing it, and it's going to be a more wasteful process. Sometimes we have to use every tool in the box, but usually not. Just a handful does it. Knowing the water chemistry is critical to knowing which tool to select, and it's important to rely on a specialist. I'm not trying to brag that we're that good. We do understand what we're doing, but I do know from experience that this is a more difficult job than most growers are capable of tackling on their own just by talking to a handful of people. You need to have a specialist involved. So when we look at water treatment, one of the things we think about immediately is water treatment or disinfecting systems. Uh, I'm focusing more on that today. Kurt 
started out at the plant with the irrigation system design. What's the best way to design an irrigation system? Les followed that up with the next step in the process, which is the filtration and pretreatment process. I am talking about mostly the disinfecting process and how to go about selecting those. The, the six that we have in our industry historically, chlorine dioxide, ozone, uh, activated H2O2, products like zero tall sanidate, UV systems have been popular in the Netherlands and, and other places and, and have made their way over here in the past uh, few decades. Heat pasteurization used to be a darling of the industry and that's, that's fading for a variety of reason. And then chlorine gas injection uh, or various chlorine injection systems have been popular. But how do you go about choosing which to use? I want to talk about really boiling it down to three key issues or three key irrigation water treatment questions, how to approach water treatment decisions, not so much how to design a system. So the first thing we start with is the source water itself, treating the source water. Whether it's a pond, a well, a municipal water supply, the local stream or river, whatever it is, how do we deal with that? The second would, that has to be addressed is biofilm control. As I'll say later, if we do not address the biofilm control issue in our water treatment system, we will have only addressed less than half, frankly, in my opinion, less than a third of the actual potential of a water treatment system. And finally, that big subject of plant health. Addressing plant health is critical. So how do, we, how do we start with that? Understanding and following the disease triangle or triad is really important. A properly designed irrigation water treatment system must address all three aspects of the disease triangle. In order for a disease to occur, we need to have a susceptible host. A susceptible host might be a plant that's weakened. It's been it's been heat stressed, it's been drought stressed, or it's been attacked. It's not healthy, it's, mechan its defense mechanisms are not working well. We have to have a conducive environment. That would be biofilm. That would be the, the presence of excess solids and excess uh, COD and BOD in the water. And of course, we have to have a pathogen source. It's interesting that if one or two of those are adequate or appropriate, the disease outbreak will generally not occur. It usually takes all three of these parts of the disease triangle to be in force to begin having a problem. So let's talk about source treatment. What are the things that we do in so source treatment? A source treatment applies to any source, whether that's surface water, rainwater in a pond, a well, or a municipal water system, or even leachate drainage from a crop. One of the, one of the things I hear commonly from growers is that uh, they have a municipal water system or a well that's very clean and therefore they do not need a treatment system. We've actually found out otherwise that treating water even from a municipal water system is important. Some of the more interesting research projects that have been done by the Center for Disease Control and Montana State University identified that putting treated municipal water in a perfectly clean, polished stainless steel pipe still resulted in biofilm accumulation within seconds of the process of the flow beginning and resulted in pathogens being released, planktonic pathogens being released within days, not weeks, but days of that water entering. So Biofilm becomes a critical issue. Source treatment is always the least problematic and the easiest to accomplish, but we pay the most attention to that in our industry. It's actually the easiest thing to deal with. Removal, filtration, chemistry correction, reverse osmosis to remove excess salts, carbon filtration to remove chlorine, water softeners if we have excessive levels of sulfates 
or, or uh, calcium and magnesium. And then disinfection are the processes and steps that we look at with source treatment. Pre-treatment cleanup is critical to success. It is always more effective to remove material mechanically through a filter than it is to reduce it by oxidation or other means. Filters are cheap, sanitizing systems and or chemicals are expensive. So we wanna clean it up mechanically if we can. That includes aeration if it's a pond source to, to get the water as good as possible before we begin. Dealing mostly with water chemistry problems and planktonic, planktonic microbes that are easier to kill in source water treatment. Most of the pathogens that we're after in source treatment are planktonic. They're free floating. They're not attached to a wall like biofilm. So most disinfection solutions can, sorry, got ahead of myself. So most disinfection systems, sorry, I'm out of sync here. I've got a slide that's for some reason not showing up. There we go. Most disinfection systems can work for water source. We can use ozone, we can use chlorine dioxide, we can use hydrogen peroxide or activated hydrogen peroxide chlorine, sodium hypochlorite, or electrolyzed water. UV light will do the job with good filtration, and heat pasteurization can do, and other things, because we have time and we're dealing with, we're dealing with pathogens and other microbes that are not attached to a surface. Putting your source, whatever it is, into a day tank always gives you more options. Again, tanks and filters are cheap and treatment is not. So we use storage liberally to reduce the average treatment flow and therefore disinfection system sizes or chemicals are reduced. If we can treat water over a 24 hour period of time, we have 1,440 minutes to deal with the problem. If we have to treat it on the fly as the, as the irrigation water is used, we may need to design a system for 100 gallons a minute instead of designing a system for 10 or 15 gallons per minute. That's real dollars. Tanks are anywhere from 20 to 20 cents to a buck a, a gallon. And most of them are 20 cents to 50 cents a gallon. And that adds up quickly when we get to reduce that on water treatment systems that can cost thousands of dollars per thousand gallons. The second thing we need to deal with after we've dealt with the source water is biofilm control. When you clean your food, you want to eat it. You don't put it on a dirty plate. Once we've addressed the source water, it's absolutely necessary to address biofilm control. Anybody that's heard me talk before knows this is one of my favorite subjects. I like to explain that it didn't just occur, but it is relatively new. For many, many decades, this industry believed that biofilm was something that occurred only in old greenhouses that had been around for a long time and had bad piping systems or had bad water. And so we really didn't need to worry about it. Uh, about two decades ago, Montana State University in Bozeman, Montana started the Center for Biofilm Engineering. CBE, and they started studying bi uh, biofilm. We've been aware of it for, uh, for over 100 years, but they began studying how does it form, how quickly does it form, what does it do once it's formed, and really started to understand for the first time that biofilm is something that we all deal with. It's in all of our piping systems, whether it's the shower in your home, or the irrigation system in your greenhouse facility, you have biofilm and the constituents of that biofilm are all of the and any of the pathogens and other microbes that have been in that greenhouse facility before. 
They live in that biofilm and they thrive in that biofilm. If water treatment fails to solve the biofilm problem, it is, in my opinion, addressing less than 50% of the design. Les talked quite a bit about biofilm in his presentation, so I won't go into lots of detail, but it is such a significant issue in horticulture irrigation but that it bears hitting on it again. Source disinfection is just the start and is much easier than eliminating biofilm. Don't put your freshly cleaned water into a dirty pipe where it's exposed to additional pathogens. CDC study found a few years back that 62% or a little over 62% of the diseases caused by waterborne pathogens, the pathogen originated from the water system piping. We also know that more than 99% of the bacteria in water systems are in the biofilm attached to the surfaces because of, that comes from whatever has been in the greenhouse before. We quickly eliminate a lot of the choices that we had available for treating the source water when we look at biofilm. If you recall, we had ozone available, chlorine dioxide, hydrogen peroxide, UV, heat pasteurization, chlorine, even copper ionization will do a reasonably good job of clearing up source water. We lose all but three of those when we look at biofilm control. Copper ionization will not cure a biofilm. Chlorine, interestingly, also will not cure a biofilm. It'll clean up the planktonic cells that are on the surface of the biofilm, but it will not clean up the biofilm matrix that that biofilm lives on. Heat pasteurization has no residual, so it has absolutely zero effect on biofilm. That's cleaning it up and putting it on a dirty plate or back into a dirty pipe. Likewise, UV has zero impact on biofilm and can't because there is no residual. You're cleaning up the water and putting it back into a dirty pipe. There are three solutions that work, and they are in order of the most powerful down to the least powerful, but they all get the job done. Ozone is the most effective because it kills biofilm on contact. Chlorine dioxide is very effective. It kills biofilm, not quite on contact, but within a few minutes. And hydrogen peroxide, activated hydrogen peroxide, will kill a biofilm again within a few minutes. So those are the three that we narrow it down to very quickly when we look at the biofilm issue. Really looking at water treatment, in my view, you look at biofilm first and then look at your source water and make sure that what your, your choice of, of disinfectant will also do what you need to do with the source water. The third thing we look at is plant health. I like to call it the hortocratic oath. First of all, do no harm. Some chemical residues or res residuals stress the root system. Even if the plant isn't damaged, the root system is damaged or harmed or it's, or it's limited in its, in its development. We do not want that to happen. That, that damages the rhizosphere and the, and the bacteria, the beneficial bacteria that we wanna see growing there. The second thing we want in plant health, besides do not harm the plant, is to maximize the plant's health. A healthy plant's own defenses and immune response system do a really good job of protecting the plant all by itself. And this isn't something that we just heard of. We all get it. It's been out, we've, we've dealt with it for a long time, whether it's plowing the earth or select, uh, selecting the right growing medium you got to have oxygen around the roots to allow, the, allow primarily aerobic beneficial mycorrhizae in the root zone to develop. And then also to create it, uh, an environment for competitive exclusion of the troublemakers, which are mostly anaerobic bacteria. But oxygen from the air isn't the only way we get oxygen to the root system. Plants, humans, animals, we mostly all share a few things in common 
in the water and nutrient uptake systems, one of those being the need for oxygen to allow them to work and to encourage the development of beneficial, again, mostly aerobic microbiota, and to deprive the mostly anaerobic pathogenic microbes that are common in our systems. The primary way we get that oxygen is not in the air that we breathe, but in the water and the fluids that we drink and the food that we eat. Your plants don't necessarily tell you that they're suffering at this point. Surprising to learn how plants are affected before we even see any signs of stress. This is from Chris Block from Wageningen University Research. Just a difference of two parts per million instead of eight parts per million of dissolved oxygen in the root environment can reduce production by 10 to 30% with no visual symptoms. If I were a grower, which I'm not, that would scare me. If I can't see the plant flagging, but it's low in dissolved oxygen, and it's reduced its production by 10 to 30 percent, that's very significant. And some of the results that we see from growers that have been reported to us by growers by simply increasing, cleaning up their water and increasing the dissolved oxygen are substantial. And here's a few of them that have been reported. I have all of these in quotes, you'll notice, because they are all quoted by the growers. The overall visibly improved plant health and vigor. The plants just look better. That goes to sell through. Plants that look better sell better and sell faster. Faster and more consistent growth. When we think about that 10 to 30% reduction in growth rate, this makes sense. Better nutrient uptake because of increased root hair and top mass ratio and uh, uh, leads to increased root hair and top mass, mass ratio and less fertilizer use. In some cases, as much as 25% reduction in fertilizer use because the plant is able to be more efficient. This is a surprising one in a way reduced pest infestation. Pests seem to like softer, sicker plants, plants that are not as robust, that don't have the vigor of a healthy plant. And so they attack those plants. If we have healthier plants, we're going to have a reduced pest infestation in those plants. A 20 to 40% reduction of, fus of fungicides and pesticide use. This goes to the 1% that we talked about earlier. Maybe any one of these reductions or savings would not be substantial, but if we add up a few percent, even if it's not 20 to 40%, just one or two or three or 5% savings in each of these areas, what does that mean to your bottom line? In some cases, it means a lot of money. In some cases, it is paid for systems in less than a year. A six to 23% improvement in germination rates. And that six to 23% is dependent on species and variety. Some, some plants don't care. Other plants care a great deal and perform extremely well. An eight to 15 day average reduction in production of, propagate, of propagated material for transplant. A complete cropping time reduction from seed drop to, fit to ship of two to four weeks, and in one case, as much as six weeks reduction, actually ended up requiring a complete change in scheduling because of that. That's where we look at things like reduced heating costs because we don't have to heat the greenhouse as soon. And reduced the, uh, the PGR residual, paclobutrazole in this case specifically, to well below one part per billion. And that was, uh, that was using 
ozone. There are other ways besides ozone of doing that. Ozone seemed to be the most effective at doing that. So what about design considerations? Again, I'm not going to try to walk through the entire design process, but the things that we've observed at DRAM that are critical to getting the best result in your water treatment system design. It takes a lot of experience to get it right. Bring in an expert that does it for a living, not your neighboring grower, not one of your friends in the industry, somebody that does it for a living. That's the only way that you're gonna, that this person is gonna know the ins and outs, the things that work and the things that don't work. Always start with your water chemistry, always. Water chemistry tells us what we have to remove from the water. It tells us how we have to remove it from the water. And it tells us where in the line we need to remove it from the water, and it varies. Remember, it always takes multiple tools. There is no silver bullet. There is no single solution that will get the job done. Always consider the process, the effect on and of the entire system. That is everything from the pond that the water comes out of, or the water tower, or the stream, or the well, and what's in it all the way through to the irrigation system and how you're putting the water onto the plants. The entire process needs to be considered. If I install a system, a tool that helps with biofilm, but it doesn't address how the biofilm is removed, I've simply moved my problem downstream. And now, I get to deal with clogged emitters for the next three weeks or the next three months. That's a common problem. We see it frequently. The biofilm starts to slough off because it's not removed properly. And now we have to, we've moved it downstream. We have to deal with it again. So it's very important to always consider the entire system, even if you're not replacing part of that system understand what that effect is going to be and how it's going to be affected by the system. It's also about where the components are placed in the process. Again, just to hit on that, buying a piece of equipment and then putting it in the wrong place is not going to get the job done. It has to be developed as part of the system. And then, Identify your objectives before you ever start. This is very important to know what it is that you need to accomplish or want to accomplish. Are you simply looking to get a negative pathogen test? You've got a Pythium problem. That's the thing that you want to have go away. You're not concerned about the other issues. Or maybe you've had a threat from the environmental authorities locally and you wanna clean that up to make sure that they're satisfied. Maybe you wanna be a good neighbor and you wanna make sure that any water leaving your property is clean. Maybe you wanna make your plants healthier and happier. That's what we hope in the design phase. But understand what your objectives are going to be in advance and be able to explain those to the professional that you bring in and work so that they can work with you in developing a system that will address those concerns first. If we develop a system that addresses the problem that you're not interested in addressing, you've just wasted your money. We at DRAM are trying to help on a continuous education process or a continuous learning basis, and we encourage you to access on our website, our DRAM white papers. You can also go back and review this and the previous two uh, webinars that Kurt and Les did online. You can pick those up and answer other questions. 
uh, don't hesitate to call one of us if you think that we can help answer a question or give provide some guidance. That being said, uh, there may be some questions out there, and we've got some time to uh, we've got some time to address those. Great, thank you so much for that very informative presentation, Al. Uh, we do have a few questions today, um, and just as a reminder to our audience, if you have any more questions for Al, uh, you can type those into the question box in your GoToMeeting panel. Um, so, Al, first question, um, can we control biofilm by just shocking it with chlorine or a hydrogen peroxide product every few months? Uh, that's a good question. I get that question frequently. Not really, and <laughs> that's a hesitating answer. It will address the biofilm if you, especially a, a, an activated hydrogen peroxide product, um, which is something that you can buy in a barrel and inject in the system. We see that used quite often to try to uh, deal with the biofilm problem, and it does help. It can help, but it will not eliminate the problem. It's really important to recognize how very quickly biofilm develops and becomes a distribution source for pathogenic microbes. It's minutes, hours, and days, not weeks, months, and years. So if you're not dealing with it on a continuous basis, biofilm is going to become an issue. One part of that also is the study of uh, biofilm has revealed that that when you, I think Les used the term anger, the biofilm, it actually comes back with a vengeance. And angering the biofilm is about removing its surface layer, but not completely eliminating the biofilm. Uh, it's a very unique mechanism. They found uh, very few like it in nature, but it actually will shift gears or change its mode of action. And when it has been threatened or irritated, uh, it will actually come back and do a better job of protecting itself. So. So shocking or, or dealing with biofilm every few months or every few years or just when it becomes a problem really is not a good and complete solution. And I see growers that have done that continue to suffer with uh, pathogen problems, particularly Pythium and Phytophthora, uh, which are very easily established in the biofilm. Great. Thanks, Al. Uh, next question here is from the Dominican Republic um, from a grower who has millions of orchids, he says, um, and he's wondering how he can deal with river water uh, to use in, in his irrigation system, and he's asking if it's better than the ozone system. River water. That's a, that's a good question. Uh, I don't see the two as being mutually exclusive because the ozone system or another type of, of effective disinfectant is a necessary evil or a necessary thing when you're dealing with river water. The, the characteristic of river water is that it is difficult to characterize because it's inconsistent. It changes by season, it changes by weather, and it generally has a very high level of turbidity. The nice thing about river water is that generally the quality is very good. The overall quality, the ion values, the balance of ions in the water, salt levels and so on are very good, particularly in a place like the Dominican. Uh, but you also have to deal with the fact that that water is often polluted. Even where water or where a stream is coming from a very good source, that water is going to have, uh, is going to have particulate in it that needs to be filtered out. So you'll have to deal with filtration. And it's also going to have pathogens in it. So you have to deal with the pathogens. So I would say that that their pre-filtration, possibly even two levels of filtration, a coarse filter to get out the frogs and sticks and small children and so on and leaves. Uh, and the next level of filtration to make it fine enough to, to, to filter out down to a fine enough level so that you can disinfect the water. And then the final step would be a disinfectant like ozone or, or chlorine dioxide or, or hydrogen peroxide. Thank you. Uh, next question is, how long does the process take once started to put in a system that includes filtration, disinfecting, et cetera? 
depends on the size of the operation. Um, in general, from the time we get a phone call or an email from a potential customer until the time we can install a system or the or the customer can we can deliver a system so that it can be installed i would say a minimum of 12 weeks till the system could be operational that includes installation labor time uh, and in some cases where the systems are very large it can take uh, it can take um, several additional months before that's done Generally, a system can be uh, designed, the drawings completed, and the system delivered in a period of eight to 10 weeks. And then the installation time is another week to, to one week to a month, depending on the size of the operation. Perfect. Uh, next question is, does the biofilm become resistant to sporadic or constant treatment unless it's ozone? Good question. Um, the, the answer really is no, that's not accurate, but there is an element of truth to it. Ozone is the most effective against biofilm because it is extremely fast acting, so it kills biofilm matrix on contact uh, but also because of the way that it kills, it's called lysing, where it actually blows up the cell from the inside out and emulsifies that cell so it can pass through. It's emulsified so fine that, that, uh, that it can actually pass through a dripper. The other two methods of biofilm control, chlorine dioxide and hydrogen peroxide or activated hydrogen peroxide, um, need to have a longer action time and uh, they need to be more complete because of the way that they kill and they can actually can result in some sloughing or some materials getting caught in the drippers so it's critical with the previous two actually with any of them to make certain that you have adequate dosing levels one of the more common problems that i've seen particularly with with uh, the activated hydrogen peroxide products is that growers are injecting it at too low of an injection ratio enough to maybe kill planktonic microbes but not enough to attack the biofilm and it's important cdc studies uh, some of which i read yesterday in preparation have found that uh, that biofilm is actually the the, the uh, pathogenic microbes in a biofilm are actually much more resistant and much sturdier than a planktonic microbe that you might find in a river or pond or, or in a municipal water supply. Great, uh, just a couple last questions here. Reverse osmosis strips everything out of the water, so can that work to disinfect the water instead of an oxidizer or UV? Effectively, yes. We see that in some parts of the, uh, in, in uh, certain segments of the horticulture world, uh, the attempt to use reverse osmosis. It can work because reverse osmosis is really just a filtration process that, that is super efficient uh, at removing particulate all the way down to maybe one micron or even less than one micron and most pathogens or a lot of pathogens can be removed in that but it will not remove all of the microbes and ro is very expensive it's very hot uh, very expensive to buy it's expensive to maintain and it's very wasteful because you're 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 uh, wasting anywhere from 25 to 40 percent of the water that's going through the system is being dumped down the drain DRAM cells, RO systems, we do some very nice reverse osmosis systems, but we focus on using that for the purpose of removing excessive levels of certain ions, such as chlorides and sodium and so on. So I would say that reverse osmosis is a poor substitute for a real disinfection system, and it shouldn't be used. It's just not cost effective. One more question. Uh, for a grower who only has disease problems occasionally, is it necessary to kill everything in their water just to be safe? 
It's a good question. No, it isn't actually. Um, the uh, it's it's not really necessary in order to prevent infection, and it's also very expensive to try to kill everything in the water. We we work by uh, what's called logarithmic reduction to determine how much of the microbes or how many path how much of the pathogenic microbes we've removed, and so we typically aim for uh, two to three, maybe a four uh, a four log reduction. Water treatment systems in uh, for municipal supplies and for bottled water need to go to five to seven log reduction. That requires a lot more equipment, a lot more filtration, a lot larger ozone systems or more or more chemical injections, whatever it is. So we generally find that it is not necessary to to remove all of the of the uh, pathogens from the water. Think back to the disease triangle that I had on an earlier slide. Uh, it's not ne necessary to remove them completely. We just need to we just need to keep at least one part of that triangle within control in order to make sure that that we don't have an infection in the plant. Great, thanks again. Um, so that's it for questions. Uh, for anyone who may have missed a few minutes of the webinar, or if they'd just like to view it again, uh, we will be sending out an email with a link to the recording of the webinar, and that will include both audio and PowerPoint. Um, you can also watch the previous webinars in the Everything Water webinar series on greenhousemag.com and nurserymag.com, and those are under the Media tab. Um, and these include part one, which is designing your irrigation system, and part two, uh, which was filtering your irrigation water to reduce shrink. Again, I'd like to thank Al and uh, thank Dram Corporation for sharing all the information today and everyone for asking questions. Uh, and that's it for the webinar. Thanks, everyone, and have a great day. Thank you, Patrick. Thanks.